We recently attended the Daniel Lecture at King's College London, which was given by Professor Tom Welton. We were inspired by the way in which he linked chemistry and his research to solving problems of the 21st century. In fact, we were so inspired we made a film on one particular aspect of his presentation and sent the link to Professor Welton. Today we are at Imperial College because Professor Welton has kindly agreed to be interviewed by Science Rocks. Professor Welton, you are the Professor of Sustainable Chemistry and the Dean of the Faculty of Natural Sciences. But at what stage in your early academic life did you decide that you wanted to be a scientist? To be honest, I never decided I wanted to be a scientist. I just, I've always done the thing that I enjoy. And whenever I'm faced with a choice of what to do next, I just think, which of these do I think is going to you know, fill my heart with joy. And I take that choice. And so I didn't, it's a terrible thing to say because we're all always talking to young people about how they have to plan out their careers. And I didn't do that at all. I just did the next thing that I thought would make me happy. And having done that, I ended up being a scientist. <laughs> Why do you think it's important to get young people into science and for them to continue science through their education and into their career? Well, like I say, it can be a fantastic source of joy in your life. If, if you're essentially nosy, then you want to know how things work and how things are, and, and that means science is a great place for you to, to go to because you can spend your whole time learning new stuff. And that's just such a fantastic joy. And I, every scientist I know is happy. <laughs> and the reason they're happy is because they're spending their time doing something that's very joyful and uh, therefore it's a good thing to do. So truly, I think the thing that's important for young people who are interested in science is to do something that they enjoy. And if that's science, then that's a brilliant thing for them to spend their lives doing. You don't have to stop at the age of 16 or 18 or 21. Thank you. You've conducted a lot of research on ionic liquids and how they react with solutes. In simple terms, could you explain what an ionic liquid is and what their practical applications could be? Okay, uh, so you're familiar with table salt, sodium chloride. If you, hate, if you heat uh, sodium chloride up enough, it will eventually melt. And when it melts, it makes a liquid that is composed of ions. That's an ionic liquid. Unfortunately, that's also 801 degrees <laughs> centigrade. And therefore, not a lot of use to anybody. You know, if you try to uh, put some organic chemical in, it would just burn. And so, 801 degrees, no use at all. But, by careful design of the ions, by making them larger, or making them... Uh, what we call charge diffuse, which means that instead of the charge being located on a single atom like it is on a chloride ion, it's spread over many atoms. So that's charge diffuse. If you make something large and charge diffuse, then you bring down the temperature at which it melts because of Coulomb's law. Mm -hmm. And if on top of that, you then make it asymmetric, so rather than having something like a sphere but something with a bit which juts out or um, doesn't have a, a, a comfortable shape. Then when it tries to pack into a solid crystal structure, because of that uncomfortable shape, it can't pack very well. And if it doesn't pack very well as a solid, then it makes a liquid. And so by bringing those different ways of designing your ions together, you can make something which is a salt, but is liquid at room temperature. And that allows you to do all sorts of things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Because now you can dissolve perfectly ordinary chemicals in and do reactions with them, for instance. And it is very, very useful. So just earlier last year, about October and November of, of last year, a big announcement was made by um, two oil companies, Chevron UOP, of a way of improving the production of high quality fuels using ionic liquids. So really, really useful. 
Uh, there are other things. There are, uh, there are several processes which are in industry. There are a, company, a company called BASF in Germany has a couple. Um, there's another uh, fuels company in Malaysia, Petronas, um, which has, a, again, a really important one for stripping mercury out of natural gas. And mercury is present in very, very, very low concentration in some national, natural gas streams. But because of the huge amount of natural gas that we use, that's a lot in absolute amount. And it can cause accidents in the, in the processing plant. Um, of course, you, know, you wouldn't particularly want to be burning something in your car with mercury in it. <laughs> that wouldn't be a good thing. So they have a process of stripping the mercury out to give cleaner uh, natural gas. And so really quite large-scale processes that use ionic liquids. Um, we recently attended the Daniel Lecture and listened to your presentation on biofuels and sustainability. Can you explain briefly why this area of research is important? So sustainability in general is important because we need to find a way of living on this planet where we meet our needs, we have the lifestyles that we want, but without wrecking the planet in the process. And that's all that sustainability is about. It's about trying to achieve uh, those two things. But I suppose it should say, even, and then there's a third thing, of course, being able to do that at a price that we can all afford. So we need to be able to do that as well. So that's important. Biofuels is one avenue of research that um, could help with this. So we know that we have, well, growing CO2 in the atmosphere, um, we have the uh, Paris Agreement to try and reduce our CO2 emissions. Biofuels can help towards that to some extent because although obviously when you burn it you're still producing the CO2, when you grow it you're absorbing the CO2 from, from the air and so you have much less CO2 production overall for the number of miles your car travels. And that's really how you should think about it. Um, it's, it. It's very easy to get caught up in all sorts of different ways of counting it, but really what you want to know is how far can I move my object that I want to move, my car with me in it, and how much CO2 does that produce? And then biofuels look quite good. They also look quite good in, in the sense that um, petroleum sources are getting more and more and more difficult to access. So either because of political problems or because of the geography of where we're getting them from. And so deep undersea wells, you know, the potential of drilling in the Arctic or Antarctic, you know, it's starting to get, well, really, we don't want to be doing this if we can possibly avoid it. And biofuels, because it's fuel from wood, mm -hmm. give you the opportunity to... Uh, use different sources and therefore not have to access those, those sources. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to turn now from your research to your teaching side of your career. We read that under your leadership, your department received a Swan Gold Award for your work in promoting women in science. Do you think there is anything extra that can be done to encourage more girls to be interested in science? Yeah, I mean, there's lots that can be done. Uh, so... One of the things that, well, it's getting better than it used to be, but one of the things that certainly, um, during my time, when I was growing up, every time you saw a picture of a scientist, you saw a picture of a man. And, you know, that makes you think that men are scientists, and that the converse of that, that women can't be, which, of course, is nonsense. And so it's really important, and we do this a lot. I don't know if you... Um, noticed on the hoarding outside the college where we've got pictures of scientists from the college. We make a real point of, of showing that we have women scientists here who are doing fantastic work and are, are leading, in fact Mary whose face is on there is you know, truly world leading material scientist and it's important that those images are put out there so people see that it's a possibility, it's something that's available to me um, and that someone who looks like I might look at their age, is doing this. And so I think that's not only important around women, that's important around all sorts of different attitudes. You know, race, for instance. Um, you don't want every face of a scientist you ever see to be someone who looks like me. Um, 
that's one of the problems that might be. Uh, <laughs> but no, you need, you, you need to have people realise that these avenues are open to them. So that's the starting place. But it's only the starting place. Then I refer to what I was talking about before, about the thing about joy. Um, helping people find the, the, the fun and the joy in science is done through curriculum. And really helping people by having curricula that are exciting. A, a lot of, again, when I was very young, a lot of chemistry. I, if you'd have told me at the age of 16 I was going to grow up as a, as, as a chemist, I would have laughed in your face. Because what was in my O-level, as it was back then, was so dull, so dry, and really didn't in any way have any kind of meaning for my life and what my life was like. And so we need to think about curriculum. We need to think about curriculum in a way that it is relevant to people. But of course, different people have different interests and, and things that are relevant to me might not be the same things that are relevant to you. So we have to think about it really carefully and make sure that we have a range of stuff in the curriculum that can appeal to all sorts of different people with all sorts of different interests. What's the, you know, I can see you've dyed your hair. You know, what's the chemistry of dyeing your hair? You know, that might be something that you would find in, interesting, but, you know, maybe not for me. So, well, OK, just because it's not for me doesn't mean it can't be in the curriculum, because it is interesting to you. So I think we need to think about the curriculum more creatively and make it relevant to everybody, or parts of it relevant to everybody. And then, you know, giving people the opportunity to, to come and see what it's like to be in our laboratories, to to be a professional scientist, because, of course, what, well, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis does not reflect what you're learning to do in school. It's moved on a long way from that. And so giving people the opportunity to see that and getting pe give, giving people the opportunity to see the bunch of people in places like this, people in companies who are doing science every day, who are having a great time and really enjoying themselves. And I think those things together will encourage anybody into science. And, of course, within that, particularly women, people who have been discouraged in the past. Um, we recently attended the BSA conference on secondary education and gave a presentation on the use of media in teaching science. How important is it, do you think, to use media in teaching science? Right, so what I have to say is my experience of anything other than very traditional things like the Daniel lecture that, that you came to is pretty thin on the ground because, well, I'm an old fart. Uh, but however, I think it is important, you know, every, every opportunity to communicate is an opportunity to communicate about science. Every medium which is available is a medium in which you communicate about science or indeed anything. And so we have to take the full range of opportunities that are available. You know, your blogs, you know, are, are not something that I could do. But it's great that you're doing it. You know, this very, this very thing that we're doing now was not available. You know, I'm looking at the camera, and in order to do this, well, even 10 years ago, it would probably have been an object that cost thousands of pounds, would, you know, sit on a tripod over there, you know, not just be something that your mum's holding in her hand. And so the, the, the possibility of doing things like that, this is new and really worth exploiting. What role do you see universities playing in encouraging more people to become interested in science? We should talk much, much more about what we do. Um, there are wonderful discoveries coming out of universities every day, and we should make more fuss of them. Uh, we, we, do, we do a better job than we used to, but again, we should use all of these things, just as we just talked, to tell people what it is that we do, to show people what we do. But I think also to show the how we do it. So right rather than just say, you know, you, you get to see it in the papers, don't you? Scientists announce, you know, wonder cure for something or other, you know. Um, you, you see those kind of things quite often, but having people see how we make discoveries, I think would, uh, again, encourage people into it as a joyful activity, and that, you know, it's great to discover something new, but actually it's a joyful joyful activity, even when you have those rotten days where you don't discover anything, um, because the process is enjoyable. Um, and I think we should make more fuss about that. We've got uh, a new campus over in White City, and we're building, well, the building's there. It's, we're, we're converting a building 
over there which will allow us to bring even more school students into the college, into the, into the reach out lab that we have um, in order to be able to do uh, well experiments in the, in the classic sense of, you know, we've developed an experiment for you to do, but actually also to have a hack space where uh, they can start to develop their own ideas. And there's no reason why you can't start that very young. It doesn't, you don't have to have, you know, passed your PhD before you can start to have your own ideas about what to do. And so we'll have that space available probably in a few years' time, two or three years' time. And being able to bring people in to do that and explore their own ideas, I think, will be fantastic. As the Dean of Natural Sciences at one of the world's top academic and research universities, what do you see as the most important areas for scientific research in the next 10 years? Oh, there is so much. And it's really hard to choose. You know, so here um, we have people who are working on trying to obliterate malaria. Okay, that's pretty important. We also have people who are trying to develop uh, new forms of energy uh, generation and, well, that's pretty important. And we also have people who are trying to discover the nature of dark matter. So not useful, like the first two, but still, you know, how is this universe made up? And you can't say one is more important than the other, or one is better than the other, or, or anything like that. What, all of these things have to happen. All of these things are important. And we can't always guess what things are going to be useful. And, you know, the, electricity is a fantastic example. So, if you go back to... Um, Faraday and uh, the, the early experiments in electricity. If you had um, sent out a call saying uh, we want people to come up with ideas to make better street lighting, they would have given you designs for more efficient gas burners, they would have given you designs for how you um, illuminate a, a, a filament with uh, with a flame in order to make it burn brighter. Nobody would have said, well, what you need to do is play around with these voltaic cells and see what comes out. And so it's very difficult to predict what will be useful in the future. We know what we use now, and, and, it's, and it's, it's very easy to be confused that when you look backwards in history, of course it always seems really obvious how you got to here. But going back then and looking forwards, it's not obvious. And, and so what I would say is really important is that we do as much different science as possible. Because we never know the place where something really new and amazing is going to jump out of at us. And it will give us a way of looking at the world that we've never had before. Which then gives us all sorts of things that turn out to be useful. So... I, I'm loath to say this is more important than that because I don't think it is. Um, and even more or less useful turns out not to be quite such an easy question to answer either. So what is important, as I say, is that we do as much as possible, as broad a range as possible, and that we allow those uh, bits of science which aren't, in the short term, seemingly useful to be done, because you never know what in the long term will be useful. Thank you for your time, Professor Watson. This has been very interesting. Thank you. This is Science Rocks.